the Theosophical Society presents Mr. Geoffrey Hodson, international lecturer and author, in a talk entitled, The Bible as a Source of Secret Knowledge. Friends, I want to make it clear that I have no desire to weaken the faith of any Christian in the literal reading of the Bible with all its admitted beauty, consolation and inspiration. Quite the contrary, my hope is that such faith may be strengthened and such inspiration increased by a deepening understanding of the hidden wisdom contained in many books of the Bible. This is, I know, rather a strange idea to some, but you know the scriptures have been regarded by some biblical scholars, many in fact, as belonging to a special category of literature, sometimes called the sacred language. What is then the sacred language? Well, the distinguishing characteristic of this kind of writing is that whilst its narratives have some historical basis, the language itself is largely, but not entirely, allegorical. It is constructed of symbols and allegories and parables, each of them containing profound spiritual and occult truths which are not readily noticeable. This language is also referred to, one finds, as the mystery language, and it is said to have been invented by initiates of the ancient mysteries. The purpose was both to reveal to those who could be helped and to conceal from those who could not be helped spiritual knowledge and the power which spiritual knowledge can bestow. The necessity for this reservation is, I think, fairly clear if we consider the use to which modern man puts scientific discoveries. One example of that is the destructive use of the energy derived from nuclear fission. The first thing we all heard about that attainment by man was to hear of the atomic bombs. Whilst then recognizing that their knowledge belonged to the race, the ancient seers and prophets saw that if placed in general hands, and particularly in the hands of disruptive elements in society, such spiritual and occult knowledge could be extremely dangerous. They therefore constructed the language in which the inspired portions of scriptures and the myths of the world have been written. Thus, whilst founded in general upon hysterical events, I am not contesting that, Whilst founding, founded in general upon historical events, the world's scriptures have also under meanings, a double, a triple, and even a sevenfold significance. You will remember perhaps that our Lord made, made use of this language when talking to the multitude, which he addressed in parables, as he said, but to his disciples as Mark reports. Fourth chapter, eleventh verse. Our Lord says unto to his disciples, by the by, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Now if you can accept this approach, let us then look at some of the well-known biblical stories and see if valuable light and truth can be discovered. One example of a very vivid use of the symbolical language is given in the sixth chapter of St. John, verses 53 and 54, where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink of his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. Quite clearly our Lord is here making use 
of the symbolical language. For of course the words blood and flesh and drinking and eating them, they're employed by our Lord only in an allegorical sense. What could they mean then? One interpretation is that the blood of God or Christ is the ever outpoured divine life by which the universe is sustained and without which it cannot live. When man becomes aware of this universal life in all beings, and when he consciously identifies himself with it, in the symbolic language he said to drink of it. You see, it means absorbing it into yourself and being so absorbed into the ocean of the life and wisdom and love of God. Symbolized by blood. Similarly, the flesh of Christ has been interpreted as spiritual knowledge or divine truth. When the human intellect becomes illumined with divine knowledge, inspired by interior revelation, this is called eating of Christ's flesh. And indeed, it does bring a realization of immortality or eternal life, as our Lord said. Then there is that remarkable story of the stilling of the tempest. That's another example of an inspired allegory, I suggest. The ship, then, is looked upon as a symbol of the body of man, which conveys the soul with its various attributes over the waters of life. The disciples are thought of as personifications of human qualities and tendencies such as the impulsiveness which Peter displayed, the business capacities of St. Matthew at the receipt of custom, the deep love of St. John, the only disciple who was present both in the courtroom and at the foot of the cross. And then Judas personifies a certain traitorship which can be in human character, for Judas betrayed his master, he represents in each one of us the tendency to fall below and even betray the highest in us and the highest truths for purely material gain. Happily, however, as on the ship, the divine presence also exists in each one of us, even if asleep for a time, just as our Lord slept when the voyage began. Then you remember a great storm arose. And in their anxiety, the disciples, facing the threat, awoke the sleeping passenger, the Lord Christ himself. He, in his majesty and might, then confronted the storm, and by a word, he stilled the raging tempest. Now, what is the message of that incident to us? Could it not be this? When we human beings are threatened by emotional stress and storm, by gusts of passion, anger and hatred, or by the cravings which we can't overcome altogether, of sensual desire, which threaten the success and even the safety of our lives, what are we to do? As the disciples did, awaken the divine power hitherto asleep within us, and evoke its aid. Thus exalted and empowered, we too will find ourselves able to say to the storms raging within us, Peace be still, and with certainty of obedience. From that wonderful story, the importance of the storms of life is also indicated in this account. For had it not been for the tempest on Galilee, the Christ might not have been awakened. The same applies perhaps to the struggles and stresses in our own lives. These experiences, rightly used, can become the means of awakening our higher, more spiritual powers. So you see, a, a wonderful story in a scripture is found to convey secret knowledge, profound spiritual and psychological truths. Then there is that other beautiful story 
which Mark records, the story of the woman healed of a hitherto incurable sickness. She had suffered for 12 years, you remember, and by the by there is a system of numerical symbology, as it's called. But I haven't quite time to go into that just now. However, in this woman a deep faith awoke that if she set forth in search of the great teacher who was in her land and found and presented herself to him by his aid and power she would be healed. She felt that strongly so that despite her weakness she set forth and ultimately she found him. But what happened then? She couldn't get near to him on account of what Mark calls the press, or shall we say the throng of people between him and herself. Her faith was very great, however, and she stretched forth her hand and touched, not the person of the Christ, but the hem of his garment. Beautiful symbol. She touched the hem of his garment, and straightway she was whole. You'll find that story in Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 30. And if it be interpreted as an allegory applicable to us all, as well as a historical fact recorded in a special manner, we who, like her, are spiritually imperfect and therefore sick, will also become whole if we do as she did. If we in our turn but seek, discover, and touch the hem of his garment, meaning the fringe of the consciousness of the Christ presence within us, the Christ in you, the hope of glory, then we will be inwardly healed. The press of people is said to symbolize all the unchristlike attributes within us, the impurity, the cruelty, the unkindness, the selfishness, and the self-indulgences which come between us and our Christ nature. Eventually these must go, but in the meantime, if like the woman healed, full of faith, we reach upwards with our aspiring thought and prayer, we in our turn may symbolically touch the hem of Christ's garment the fringe of the divine power within us. Those of you who have achieved this will know that when once the consciousness of the divine self within has been experienced, floods of inspiration and healing grace descend upon soul and body. Thereafter, it may be said of us, straightway we are whole. There is another symbol which is used very much in the scriptures of the world. It is the symbol of the mountain or the mount. What does that mean? Well, the mount is said by symbologists to be a symbol of this uplifted state of consciousness to which I've just been referring. You will remember that many of the great events recorded in the Bible happened upon the mount. Elijah, for example, had need of counsel of the Lord, and a voice said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. This may be interpreted as an exhortation to elevate the center of human awareness towards the inner spiritual nature of man, the mountaintop within him, the Everest of the soul. Then, in the story of Elijah, you remember, there came a rushing wind, symbol of disturbed emotions, and the Lord was not in the wind. Next came an earthquake, symbol of purely physical consciousness, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then came a fire, symbol of the restless and disruptive activity of a critical, analytical, and prideful mind, and the Lord was not in the fire. However, after wind, earthquake, and fire, meaning when the consciousness has been lifted above the emotions, the physical body and the mental levels, then there descended upon Elijah a great peace. His soul was steeped in silence, and therein the voice of the silence was heard, 
the still small voice of the God within man. Do you see how a beautiful story of a supposed historical fact really can contain profound psychological and spiritual secrets and truths. That story may be seen as a manual of meditation, a description of the means whereby self-illusion, I beg your pardon, whereby self-illumination may be obtained. The center of self-awareness, personified by Elijah, must be dissociated as successively from the physical body, from the emotional body, the rushing wind, and from the mind, the fire, and established on those still higher levels, the mount, wherein the spiritual self of man perpetually abides. It is found that a profound stillness then descends upon the devotee, and in that quietude of heart and mind, Self-identification is attained with the God-Self, the Christ-Nature within. Thereafter, illumination, comprehension, knowledge, the still, small, inward voice are communicated to the mind and the brain of the outer mortal man. You will have noticed, perhaps, that in these interpretations which I have offered you, quite undogmatically, each story is regarded as descriptive of an interior, subjective experience as well as a historical event, as if all happened within the soul of every man. Is that in accordance with biblical teaching? Oh yes, St. Paul evidently took this view himself. For him, the nativity of Christ was not only a historical event, it was an, an interior experience. For he said, didn't he, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Do you remember those words of the German mystic of the Middle Ages, Scheffler, who wrote as Angelus Silesius? He put before us in a beautiful poem the necessity for this deep interior experience of episodes in the life of Christ in these words, amongst others. Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, and not within thyself, thy soul will be forlorn. The cross on Golgotha thou lookest to in vain, unless within thyself it be set up again. There you have a mystic, spiritual and secret truth revealed in the historical events concerning the life of our Lord. Such deep realization of the divine presence and activity within every man brings down floods of spiritual and intellectual power. This power could, of course, be seriously misused to the detriment both of others and of the user. And that is why this safeguard has been used, the safeguard of the symbolical language, which conceals from the profane and yet reveals to the worthy that spiritual knowledge which is indeed a source of mighty power. Thus, the, the whole Bible, you know, has come to be regarded by many scholars as a collection of such allegories history written in the language of symbols, to preserve, to conceal, and to reveal truths which were normally taught direct only to those who were pledged pupils of spiritual teachers, just as was recorded of the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember, and I'll just repeat it, he said to his disciples, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. According to this point of view, the four Gospels then do not record the history of external events in time alone. The inspired authors of the Gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, also reveal eternal and power-bestowing truths. They also, and at the same time, describe spiritual attainments. 
experiences, sensory and supersensory, of every human being. Thus, the gospel narrative may in general be regarded as of threefold significance. It is the story of the life of Jesus the Christ. It is also, as St. John informs us in his opening verses, the story of the universe from its beginning or birth to its end or ascension. And in addition to this, third, the Christ life is a universal life. It's your life and my life, and especially after we are spiritually awakened, or, as it is said, reborn, and our supersensory and spiritual powers begin to be highly developed. The Gospels tell of the formation or birth and of the evolution, both of the whole universe to relative perfection and of the soul of individual man to Christhood. And especially, and this is important, especially does the immortal story of the life of Christ also reveal the final stages of the way of holiness, treading which every man ascends through sainthood to the development of the great mental and spiritual powers which culminate in perfected manhood, or as St. Paul put it, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, this view makes the life of Christ not only something which happened so long ago, 2,000 years, but something which is happening now, or and as has ever happened within the soul of aspiring, reborn human beings. Now, I'm quite aware that this view of the Gospel narrative as a description of events occurring within the soul of spiritually awakened man will sound strange, particularly to some of you who hear of it and are hearing of it now, perhaps, for the first time. I would say to you, don't hastily discard it. Study it. It can be very helpful. Let me just briefly consider with you the nativity of Christ from this point of view. Let us examine the well-loved Christmas story as a description of a profound interior experience, as an example, an experience which can come to any one of us. This experience in the symbolical language is described as a birth, a nativity, which means the, the awakening and the coming to power of the Christ nature within the soul of every man. St. Paul called it the Christ in you, the hope of glory. The first biblical symbolical references to the historical birth of the Christ child consist of the prophecies in the Old Testament of the later coming of the Messiah. These psychologically correspond to the early stirrings of spiritual power within a man or woman who has hitherto been living a normal, natural, and perhaps even worldly life. But after a time, what has been called a divine discontent is experienced, and to that there is gradually added an inexpressible longing of the soul for God, for the infinite. The voice of conscience, personified by John the Baptist and his mission, becomes stronger and stronger until at last it's irresistible. Such experiences are promises, as it were, prophecies, foreshadowings of that interior mystical birth or awakening of the Christ powers within man to which St. Paul also referred. Do you remember his words in Galatians 4 verse 19? He wrote, I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. St. Paul knew of the symbolical language and the interior significance of the stories of the great outer events. Let us continue. The prophecies in the Old Testament are followed in the New, of course, by the mission of John the Baptist, whose call to the people of his time to repent may be interpreted as the voice of the higher self of man, 
a voice which, if heeded, eventually becomes the impelling summons of a fully awakened conscience. As a result, the daily life is purified of selfishness, sensuality, and self-indulgence. Possessiveness begins to be outgrown. Service on behalf of others assumes an ever larger place in the life of the aspirant. Eventually, the inner self rules the outer man, and a spiritual mode of life amidst worldly duties is embarked upon. A kind of interior annunciation has occurred from the very highest self of man, the dweller in the innermost, sometimes called the monad, a mighty spiritual power descends, a veritable creative fire, an annunciation. This descent of power produces profound psychological and spiritual awakenings and developments. A birth from within the soul occurs. Supersensory powers and spiritual intuitiveness are born. New faculties are awakened, and a Christ-like attitude towards life becomes quite naturally adopted. A deepening sense of unity with God and with all beings develops, and this leads to a life like that of Christ, a life of self-surrender and sacrificial love. Thereafter, this newfound realization dominates the thoughts, the motives, the words, and the deeds of the outer man, and his life becomes completely reformed, reorganized. The nativity within has occurred. Mystically, and in the terms of my address to you, mystically, such an individual is said to be reborn, or as our Lord said, born again. Such, friends, is the true Christmas, the Christmas of the soul of man.